And the next uh, event is our keynote uh, poet, Jeff Hardin. So buckle up and listen, he's awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me to read and talk to you today about poetry, which is <clears throat> pretty much about the only thing I really do all the time. Um, I write a poem pretty much every day and have for most of the last three decades. Uh, and in fact, I want to begin with the poem that I wrote this morning. I've been writing and publishing a few poems through the kind of recently, but I started these probably 14, 15 years ago. And I, I kind of thought of them as kind of protest poems. Um, but instead of going out into the street, although a lot of people do that justifiably, um, I thought of my poems as taking up the causes of certain ideas, words, values. So I've been writing and publishing these for a few years. This one's called Taking Up the Cause of Fullness. It's, it's actually still in my journal. <laughs> Some we lose seem never to have been here, while the presence of others anchors the years. Maybe some truths are all shadow instead of light. Wordsworth's breeze still comes to me, Keats and I keep time, but no, we cannot hold it. My heart, like Issa's singing leaf, drifts farther on. Each word's translation of wind, of alianthus, of barn roof against the horizon, takes us back to a day when being forgotten felt like a gift. How cumbersome the mind is with all its demands. Not every ripple coming ashore has to be fraught with meaning. A wingtip veers, plunges, disappears. I could spend my life writing odes to vowels and still not reach heaven. But I sense a fullness I'm only part of, but central to, gathering us all in. Thanks. <clears throat> And I thought I would also, um, I would open kind of in the beginning of this and honor our friend Louise Collin. Um, I know she and I read together for the Poets for the, for the, from the Neighborhood series and um, just such a wonderful presence. She published a poem a few years ago in the online journal One, and I'm actually one among several editors for that journal and um, so I thought I would read her poem. Evening at Fox Hollow Inn by Louise Collin. Come to the fire pit made round with fitted stones. Look to the stars dripping light. See the constellations move over the sky. Out on the mountain, just at the edge of our yard, a coyote howls. And two more answer from the mountaintop. A deer is trapped between them. It may be just a fawn. They sing the merciless songs of nature. The mountain was old when it was created out of ancient rocks and soil pushed up toward the clouds. Trees and vines hide the coyote, deer, turkey, skunk, Possums, rabbits, snakes, owls, squirrels, redbirds, and the slave-built stone wall, which is all that is left at the home of pioneers of unknown names who lived in the valley below us. The bees in their hives are sleeping. Come closer to the fire. The wind is cooling. Watch the faint light tracing the mountaintop promising tomorrow. Okay. 
And I thought, I, too, I would, uh, I'm going to sprinkle throughout part of this reading um, references to books or the library, since we're in a library, and it seems like in some ways libraries are um, under assault, I guess, uh, or librarians. Which got me to thinking about the librarians that I grew up with. Um, in fact, my elementary school librarian, Miss Reeves, um, I'd like to thank her. She gave me the keys to wonder and reverence and awe and so many other things. Um, she let me check out any number of books that I wanted. They had a rule about how many you could do in, as an elementary school uh, kid, but she didn't really apply the rules to me. She knew how voracious I wanted to absorb everything. Um, well, anyway, a lot of years ago, probably oh, not quite three decades ago, but very, very close, <laughs> I think about 27, 28 years ago, uh, I was kind of doing a workshop once and I said, hey, we should write postcards from some, you know, really unusual location. And, um, you know, I kind of envisioned, you know, some Caribbean island or wherever. I mean, you know, I don't know where these people might write postcards from. So, uh, but I ended up writing a postcard from the library. <laughs> that was my that was my exotic place, I suppose. And this is called from the center of the library. It's never appeared in a book, but it was published in a literary journal many many years ago. There are no books here, no crisp pages, ancient smelling, finger fingertip swirl stained that I have looked on to hear this place, this narrowed aim, which is what words are, pointed toward but never arriving, that I have stood here knowing imprecisely this is center, beneath my feet, is mystery, wealthy with air, and I can breathe here. My lungs, could I or you see them, are immaculate, absent of toil, Inside each breath there are beginnings, millions upon millions, stumbling after another to open the body's intricate concerts. A moment lasts only long enough to never have the chance to be remembered. This, dear friends, negotiators, readers, is the center. Out from here swell stacks and stacks of failed attempts. Yeah, y'all don't y'all don't have to clap. Um, and then uh, I, I'm just kind of looking down. I, I have lots of poems, obviously, in books because I've got my seventh book just came out. But I have so many other poems that I I really forget. <laughs> I just forget that I write them. I came across this one this morning. It's called Fleet Foot. I, I, it just kind of seemed humorous to me. Fleetfoot, this time Coyote gets the charge just right. The length of fuse expertly hidden. Even the detonator works. The speed of the flame meets the flash of the bird. A poet just once finds the inexplicable ignited word. I don't know if you guys grew up watching the Roadrunner stuff. Um, anyway, that was kind of funny. And I'm going to go back um, as well to maybe my very first, very first book. Um, because I was looking around and I noticed that a particular poem um, called Early Spring Sanctuary. This book has a lot of... Uh, Midsummer Sanctuary, Late Fall Sanctuary, Midwinter Sanctuary. It's a series of poems that are spread out through the book. And uh, this one's called Early Spring Sanctuary. I wrote it on this date in 2003. So 19 years ago today, uh, April 30th, Early Spring Sanctuary. Inexplicably, the yellow pansies are angelic. Realizations ground bursting here and there. Spring revving up like nobody's business. 
bloom after bloom after bloom after bloom. No room for dark or blemish, even in the darkest hearts. Mine, for instance. All falter and lost gleam, pious purged, drenched in the ooze of the commonplace. None of that today, though. None tomorrow. Day after next, who knows? February filled the water table. March was mild and waiting for its dew. April, too. Afternoon palettes adding hues and bold lines. Can't help but think of Moses, Heston bearded and singed by God's shadow. One strike on the rock, the water set to issue forth. One strike, the promised land kept past his reach. And you and I, nameless sun lovers, responsible for no one, going the ways we wish to go, wake these mornings to pink azaleas, grass so thick we'd never count the blades, each full and green, disputing nothingness. Hardly seems fair, hardly seems righteous, but I stretch out on the lawn's candescence and stare up through the lush of what's around me. Green buds on the dogwoods, spillage of honeysuckle, iris, tipsy, and begonia blessed, and I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it. So, uh, you know, it's just a, thanks. Um, thinking about that, well, I mean, that's almost two decades ago. It's another kind of voice, I suppose, another kind of way of thinking about uh, poems. And I think, um, at least for myself, I'm always um, attempting to find a different shape for a poem or a different kind of structure. Um, subject matter, well, that increases as your information increases and you read and have new life experiences. But uh, the package that the poem goes in, I'm always trying to find some new shape, I suppose. Um, so I thought I'd read, um, I wrote, I've written a whole series of poems that are, for me, that they're just couplets, two lines at a time as a way to kind of shape the poem or hear the poem differently. And this is called A Song of My People. The people I've, well, let me say this before I start. Um, I grew up uh, in Hardin County, Savannah, Tennessee, which is about a, uh, what, 100 miles, 120 miles maybe from Franklin. And um, spent a lot of time on a creek bank, rivers. Um, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. So a lot of what I do, writing poems and reading and teaching literature, and uh, it's a little foreign to the experience that I grew up with. And so I sometimes still go back and think about the people I grew up around and try to give a voice to their world. But in many ways, they probably would never read it. A Song of My People. The people I've tried to sing of never cared one whit and turned back to campfires and bean rows and whatever sadness lay deep in their thoughts. There were shut-ins to look in on and someone's fallen tree to cut and haul away. And had I asked what question follows all their days, they would have thumped me good and spent no time explaining why. One would have motioned, hand me that wire cutter, and another trembled a rolled up cigarette to his lips and shook his head at nonsense. They've all been gone for years. For that's the one true answer to any question. But mornings and evenings I hear them rattling around inside me. Tool shed carpenters shoring up steps. Hatchet throwers and pool sharks. Old men rummaging coffee can catch-alls for a lug nut or washer. A wheat penny. A buckeye. A cave-found fossil. They make a song of searching after saw blade files and needle nose pliers. A note goes high, then low, contemplative as an eddy, 
some long-gone lonesome hinge on a hayloft door, and I moved to speak, to say their time and place, the words of who we were and came to be. And one goes silent as he always did, and another slams a tailgate shut, and one leans down to hook a chain to pull someone from a ditch, and one nods and shrugs his chin and lets that be a sort of answer. I think about the ways they did that kind of, you know, <laughs> it's just, you didn't say anything. You just kind of like mo made some kind of motion and everybody knew what it meant. Um, it's kind of weird. That got me thinking as well about, um, well, this is called Out of Ways. And, and I'm, I'm always curious about the way people use language. I mean, that even that phrase, like, out of ways. Where do you live? Out of ways. You know, out of ways in the country or something like that. It must be nice to be able to say you live out of ways away from everything or up a hollow at the foot of such and such mountain or at the fork of Rogers Creek or Indian Creek where only a few good friends know the way to but seldom visit providing time enough to find time enough to do what you love most, which in the fall includes watching leaves. I am their way across the grass and lift that final time before they settle back and disappear amid the others. Other times you think you've sensed the first turn toward winter, that unexplainable dip in the air, like a phoneme in a word you think it best to whisper, but not to anyone livingly present. But what happens next after you've sat there, trying as best you can to accord who you are to what the time remaining seems to be, what the day's last hour wants to tell? Maybe nothing, that's what. And even nothing, just like always, resolves what needs resolving quietens down what seemed already quiet. And only then will you decide to gather stray bits of your thinking and go inside and give up what proved a brilliant day. But not just yet. Not for another moment or two. Not while there's still some hint in the near dark of one more thing set to happen you'll mostly have to imagine to see. So um, one of the, I guess, shapes that, um, that I find myself writing in quite often is, um, well, it's a 15-line poem, but it's five three-line stanzas. And it seems like that's a, a kind of ready-made arc, at least for my mind. And so I can just kind of uh, start with anything and then... It'll close itself out in three lines, and then, and then I can pick up with something else. Hopefully there's a connection, an intuitive, kind of resonant sense that these things hold together. Um, I probably strain that at times, <laughs> but that's okay. But um, yeah, if, uh, this book, uh, Notes for a Praise Book, I think there are 50 poems in this book, and there are 26 of them that are these 15 line poems. In fact, I like this shape so much that there's a little book, I have a little chat book that came out last year called Generosity for a Later Generation. Every poem in this book is one of these five, three line stanza poems. So this is called A Myth That Changes With Every Retelling. You really shouldn't settle for a boaster such as I. This could get ugly, and someone might weep. And how embarrassing for all if it turned out to be me. My tears are sorry anyway and never did anything good. The birds can't bathe in them. 
The thirsty can't drink them. They pollute all the wells and wither the crops. What pops in my head I can't take credit for. So much randomness turned to order and vice versa. Yet what can I do when detractors line up with their sticks? Here's what I offer instead. A memory of how I used to leap across leaf piles and make up a song, believing I soared above entrances to hell. Then again, what do I know? My memories, like anyone's, have turned into myths that change with every retelling. I open my mouth and some worlds vanish. Others begin to appear. So I want to revisit the, um, the idea of books for a minute. And so many, many years ago, my closest poet friend, Will Mills, Will died about 10 years ago, 2011. But um, he was house-sitting in a North Carolina town. He was actually house-sitting for the, the author, Andy Dillard. And so Will was teaching uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill as a visiting uh, poet, and he was just house-sitting. And he begged me to come over during my spring break, so I eventually did. I think this was 2008. And um, I've read Annie Dillard. I've got lots of her books. But it was a, a weird thing the next morning when I woke up and I realized that that bookcase and that other bookcase in this room that I'm in those are Annie Dillard's books. <laughs> and um, so I, before I ever got out of bed, I wrote a poem called Waking in a Room of Books. I didn't make any mention. You guys are in on the secret. You, you're the only ones who really know it was Annie Dillard's books. So. I've always known that someday I would know a lot beheld through every window pane. And here I am propped up in bed, redeemed by sight to see again what's grown familiar, having happened just this once, for always, a deja vu of faith made manifest, so that I look again to look again at light that formed me, forming what I see. It rises out of everything, the floor, the window sills, the table's rounded edge, the camera lens askew, turned toward the wall, and from the ridges of the author's names well placed, the dust along the spines, the space between the dust, and what's inside of that. I don't know if it's important that this is a book of sonnets, but it gave me a shape, right, to put poems into, and so I have a whole series of these uh, a whole book of sonnets, which still seems seems a little strange to me, but um, and then another another kind of uh, playfulness that I was doing for a long time. I had a whole series of friends that I would send these back and forth with, and um, they're kind of based on the the tonka form, the Japanese. Um, kind of predates haiku and five lines there's a particular kind of syllable count which doesn't necessarily translate to English necessarily but we we tend to translate it five seven five and then seven seven for the last two lines I, I didn't really keep track of syllable counts but that was just a way of thinking through about five lines and I would send these back and forth to friends by email and I'm like 2001, 20, over 20 years ago when I started doing this. And then they would send poems back to me and it became, became this kind of conversation. Really kind of wonderful. Uh, a couple of my friends, Michelle Miller and Becky Yanian. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, I, I call these, uh, at the time I called them speculations. I didn't really know what to call them. I, but now I just call them five-liners. 
And so I would invite you to play around with writing five lines. I'm just going to read a, a kind of arc of these, if that's okay. I love best the smallest poems. They say, I want, but know they have to settle. Given a choice between emptiness and fullness, I choose the hand of the one asking. The haikuist studies the shade of the pine tree till he loses count of the years. Listen, frogs, just once, let me see you before you jump in the pond, startling my heart. Some days, I'm out walking a gravel road. Just one more Luther lost on his way to find the church door. I'm always spooked by sorrowful people sneaking up behind me just as I bend for the four-leaf clover. I wish the glass blower knew me and would spend the day revealing all the fragile shapes breath can be. This morning, a leaf fell so slowly, I rifled through several decisions, making none of them. In the empty chapel, I whisper, holy. And then, for no good reason, I dance a swift jig. You can't tell me the hummingbird hasn't raced away to go write something in his notebook too. Well, yesterday I was desperate to know, but now I'm just an old bucket off the side porch. The far reaches of the galaxy and the root of the turnip are equal distance from me. Like light, light like roots at the base of a tree, yet you insist on being in a dither? This language, so casual, we say post-war. Why not post-tulip bloom, post-hayfield cleared? Big subject death, you are not so big. Swallow me someday, you'll still not be satisfied. Even small I was satisfied. So those have been a lot of fun. I've probably written like, you know, a thousand, <laughs> a thousand of those five liners. Um, a few years ago, a, a guy named Steve Miller, who teaches book arts at the uh, University of North Al or University of Alabama, did a um, a little handmade book of a hundred of these, and you have to pay a little bit more than a dollar for every single one of them. I mean, it, it's a it's pretty expensive, but it's beautiful. It's a beautiful book. So I have a new book out called Watermark. And um, so about 18 years ago, roughly around 2004, I got I, I kind of had this idea of taking old phrases from some of my poems that had never gone anywhere and making them the titles of new poems. And in fact, I did that. Uh, there's one in this book that is, uh, I had a phrase, um, how quiet must I be? I wrote it at the top of the page. And, but as I wrote it, I ended up thinking this way, but also thinking vertically like an X, Y axis. I was always pretty good at math. And so I ended up taking the phrase and then positioning it, positioning it down the margin and then writing a poem that kept stitching back through these words. Kind of like a what I what I thought of as a watermark uh, phrase, or a whispered prayer, or a subliminal message behind the poem. And then, obviously, the first one was just something out of my own work. But I suddenly thought of um, a lot of phrases that had been central to my life. A lot of them from literature, and many of them from the Bible, and and even the band U two, um, Irish band. 
And it turned out a lot of phrases are about five words. Um, I have promises to keep, Robert Frost says, or you must change your life, Reiner Rilke says. But so I ended up writing a whole series of these poems over the next few years, mostly completed around 2009, although I think there may be a, two or three stragglers that came a little later that ended up in the book. Um, and so I thought I would, I would read a few of these maybe. This, this one has a, the, the phrase, no lie can live forever from Martin Luther King. If you're familiar with that, the, the title of the poem is For When the Days Seem Absent, Any Answers. No is sometimes the affirmation a soul most needs. A mountain brought to its knees before a valley stretching miles ahead. Idea so vast the mind cannot contain it. Signs and wonders lie everywhere around us. Like the morning I saw a parking lot puddle filled with birds, a hundred frolicking and cleansing themselves, rejoicing, I'm tempted to say. In that way, a person can discern without a single doubt a message has been given. For I admit that I believe, have always believed, such moments seek us out to show us what's unseen within the life we live. So I received it, spoke yes aloud, while sailing over roads and in and out of neighborhoods, sang it, really, over and over, out of tune, I'm sure, though wide awake inside forever, if that's conceivable, and even if it's not. You should have seen me to the ends of my existence doing my own cleansed dance, feeling all around me that cool water's truth. I, I mentioned uh, the band U2. Um, I think there are, there are three of, of their phrases that are watermarked uh, phrases for these poems. Some of you may know that there's a song of theirs called God Part Two. I think it's a um, a response that Bono wrote to John Lennon's song called God. Uh, but then even even in that, he makes reference to Jimi Hendrix, you know, uh, Kiss the Sky. Remember a bit, Jimi, Jimi Hendrix? Excuse me while I kiss the sky. And Bono says, uh, if you want to kiss the sky, better learn how to kneel. So this is called Empty to Forethought and What Happens Next. And it has that phrase. Better days are unlikely since no other day exists but this one. Continually returned unto itself, replenished and enlarged, cicada stretched and oak shadow woven. May I learn the unreadable text of its passing, the irrefutable summons inscribed upon my breath, to offer myself up, abeyance and praise, emptied of forethought and what happens next. How I breathe, one writer said, is important. Did he have in mind the vowless name of God that can't be pronounced, only exhaled? Is it dispensation of grace that leads to this need to be still? To listen out beyond the reach of all words, to hear inside the inside a deeper and deeper call, tender and tender. May the words from my mouth kneel, bow down, bleed out their substance till they're wordless and finished, husk caught away, moving across grass and stems in the moment of the moment affirming itself. Um, 
I may just come back to another one of those a little bit later. So as I said, um, I've always kind of been interested in the language that people use, words they keep uh, circling back around to, that kind of thing. Um, so this is called an instrument, and it has a couple of, actually about three things I think that I, I heard repeated quite often when I was growing up. My people would say pert near. Y'all have heard that? Pert near. My people would say pert near, and what do you allow with a voice that sounded like listening all night to a campfire? And when cicadas started up, it just made sense to stare up into the oak's highest branches and be in no hurry to come back from wherever thinking took them. And there was not one bit of irony in saying, I'm an instrument, to believe one's life was made to serve others, sometimes only to bake a pie or to sit all evening with a neighbor's grief or to clear a fallen tree. Like them, I am an instrument, a voice saying what binds me to others, allowing the scent of rain that doesn't come, and this history of histories drifting away, and these small warmths I tend, inviting anyone in need to draw near. I might just read a couple more poems and we're going to have some questions or if you want to do that. Um, so I'll read this one. Um, it's just called Being, Being in Your Own Mind, which is, <laughs> I suppose, where we all are. Uh, it's hard to get over to somebody else's mind. Um, and it's hard enough to deal with being in your own, right? But sometimes you're with your own kind of people. So I hope that's where we are today. Being in your own mind. When you're with, say, your own kind, those toward whom you do not feel a need to prove yourself, to explain the context out of which you speak. Being in your own mind's ease is easier then. No fiddling to find the right word to convey belief in sacramental places like eddies along a creek's slow course or underneath a sycamore's million leaves. No need to think you need to craft an argument for studying the stems of sapling oaks for following a hawk that holds itself aloft along what's left of some horizon line. Your own kind knows the things you know, the way a cedar makes the soil acidic and how a dogwood often grows nearby, the way a wren builds decoy nests and how the men a generation back would take it on themselves to stop and mend a fence because they saw it needed done. You used to think the mind could hold a truth, but now you see the mind is like a walnut hull before the vastness of the sky. The mind is smaller than it thinks itself to be. Sometimes you let your own heart be a hymn Nobody else can hear beneath your words. It wanders like its Lord inside the coolness of the day. And no one needs to know to know the knowing it has come to know. Not your kind, at least, who stand around and nod agreement at the thing you didn't say you didn't need to say because not saying it is how you, your kind, sometimes let it say itself. So I think there's this um, 
you know, it's this desire perhaps to, I mean, we have this language, right? But it'd be great if we could find another one. <laughs> uh, and I'm not necessarily just talking about, well, I guess I'm thinking about a kind of ideal language, right? Um, I was thinking about uh, W.S. Merwin, the poet W.S. Merwin, and one of his books called Travels many years ago. I think the very first line in the book is, uh, or first line of the second poem, says, uh, I always knew I came from another language. Another language. So long as someone's out among the weeds and sage grass, we'll likely hear the music of that other language, the one passed back and forth between the river and the sky. You won't catch me apologizing for all the piddling I did as a child. Even now, I look down and can't explain why no stick is in my hand to drag along behind. In the middle of the night, my father would wake us to drive the back roads of a universe of silence. And now, no one can tell me that I don't belong to heaven. Why aren't we asking each other for more assurances? I'll give you my voice, and you give me yours, and we'll let that be the start of prayers we haven't known. As far as I can tell, the Savior of this world wrote only in dust the sins of those who stood nearby. We can't know His handwriting except where we kneel. Maybe that'll be a good spot to, to end. Well, do y'all have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I remember all the title. I did. I I don't think I even took a photo. Maybe I should have done that. That would be probably worth worth keeping track of. But there are probably a lot of the same books that we all have, you know. Although I, I I think I was looking for some of her books and they weren't in that room, but those were at home in my room. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know if you do that, but when I, if I'm ever at somebody's house, I find myself looking at their bookcase, <laughs> if they have one, um, just to kind of see what I might be overlooking, you know. And what it says about them. Yeah, maybe what it says about them, what 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 their interests are and curiosities, that kind of stuff. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My question is this. You were speaking with the haiku and short poems and how you were looking to different forms and structure. And I think you said something to the effect that the content is um Yep. My question is, do you do you ever experience a tension between form and content? And how do you perceive um, is it resolvable, is it unresolvable? What do you do about it? Yeah, so yeah, but that tension between form and content, how do you resolve that? Uh, I mean obviously yes, the the answer is there's always that tension between the shape of the poem and then what is either emerging or not emerging. Um, you know, even down to the, the level of, think about if, if you've written three, let's say two lines that are roughly close to the same length, but the thought that comes next isn't, isn't a full line, something feels out of balance, doesn't it? Something feels as though, okay, I need to flesh that out or reshape this because it it doesn't visually look symmetrical 
which is a different kind of tension, I think. Um, I think for myself, though, no matter which shape, I, if, I, if I write a sonnet, which I went through a whole period of time writing sonnets, um, you know, that conflict between the octave and the sestet, that's, that's at work there. If you're doing a, a, a haiku, well, the first line and maybe the, the turn that happens in a haiku instinctively, uh, whether it's the first line or maybe you've written two lines and then there's a shift that happens. Um, I think it's just tension is tension and conflict are are central to the poem, whatever shape it is. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's really fascinating to kind of think about. Um, maybe there's a whole essay or someone's written about it, I'm sure, or could. Oh. And um, maybe you can find one in a book. If you can't, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably. Uh, so do you come down on the content side or on the form side? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think I'd probably come down on the content side myself. Um, but I'd probably keep working to, to mail the form and the content. Um, of course, I, I know I, I quote this sometimes. It's about the only, I, I know two of my poems off the top of my head. <laughs> so I should practice this a little bit more. But, but talking about a shape um, or a form, in my fifth book, No Other Kind of World, um, many, many years ago, I, I, I came up with this idea of a poem where the, there were only like maybe two or three words per line. I don't tend to do I, you know, my lines are longer but I had the idea of taking the the last word of these three line little stanzas and every word down the page in each of the the last word of each stanza rhymed and I had never really seen that and then I I wanted to, to see if it could be one sentence as well uh, so I wrote a whole bunch of these and you know most of them didn't turn into anything worthwhile but I did write one, uh, it's, it's called In Winter, and it goes directly from the title into the, into the poem. In winter, the pine trees' limbs fill with snow, grow tense. With being on the verge, if not from weight, then from suspense, of crashing down along this length of side yard fence, which admittedly is little more than pretense, and holds nothing in, but nonetheless provides a lens, a frame, through which most evenings I admire a late light rents down the barn's roof of fifty years of hedge apple dents, there where a child I often climbed, but haven't since, though where else, where else ever felt so, so small and immense. And, you know, to me, there feels like there's the thrust of what I'm trying to say or what I'm finding my way to say, but I'm trying to always hit this echoing note, right? And so that makes it makes the writing of the poem, um, you know, like a puzzle to figure out or something, and or or just playful. I mean, even the the idea of a puzzle makes it sound too cerebral, I guess, which I suppose there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but um, but I like the playfulness of it. And you know, I wish I had written more of that. Well, I did, um, I think there's one, maybe one other in this book. Um, and I, you know, playing with um, that little shape, I spent a lot of time at a creek side, as I'm probably apparent from some of my poems, but there's a there's one in here, yeah, letting out line. Oh, and by the way, this came up 
it came about because I, I saw the word protagonist. And I do these little exercises, Bruce, where I, I, write, I write a word and then write an echoing word and echoing word and echoing word. See how many I can just do off the top of my head. I know you can find something online like a rhyming dictionary, but I'm trying to search my own brain, right? And so I wrote the word protagonist, and it didn't even end up in the poem. You know, I was so disappointed. But letting out line, only a little while I stood there in the mist, looking upstream at the willow oak leaves loosed down to float the currents near rest. I'm playing around with slant rhyme here. I let drop my line and lure, flicked my wrist toward a low limb shade of shadows, but missed. Then reeled in and tried again, obsessed with landing a slow motion, perfectly placed, unspooling silence out of silence cast, the kind where briefly the moment is lost, is pushed to an outer edge, straining to resist, then reappears where the bobber kissed. So if you've ever been fishing, you know, <laughs> I, I used to um, really obsess about like trying to place a cast. You know, like I imagine the, the spot next to the log or the you know deep green and just try to put it exactly where I'm, which I realize now is not really any different, David, than, than trying to hit the right word. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, I used to bat rocks. I used to be a baseball player. You only hit a baseball perfectly once, twice, maybe three times in your whole career. Every other time, it's it's just almost perfect, but it's not perfect. And you you know you're trying to write a poem that feels the same way, like it's it's almost there, <laughs> or or more likely, it it feels like you hit it when you're done. And then you read it the next day and you're like, oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll circle back around and the poem I led off with today that I wrote this morning, I'll be embarrassed that I read it. So, but anything else? Any questions? So it's about uh, if you poems every day on Facebook. Yeah, I put a, well, uh, about... Three, three and a half years ago, maybe, I started a, an entirely secret Facebook group called Harden Daily. This is essentially, I mean, the origins of this date all the way back to uh, our friend Bill Brown. Um, if you're familiar with the poet Bill, Bill Brown, uh, Bill's one of my, you know, longest standing buddies. And we, we had met, I don't know, 2008 or nine or so, or even earlier up in Nashville, and as we would do, and I was reading some of his poems, he was reading mine, and I said, these are better than what I read on Poetry Daily, or Verse Daily, and um, actually what I need is a Brown Daily, and then I, I, th I said, oh, that's actually not a bad idea, hey, why don't I do this, Monday through Friday, we will send each other a new poem, we don't have to comment, we're not trying to impress each other, we're already impressed, um, we'll just a fellowship of sharing poems. And uh, so we cooked this idea up, or I did, and out of that came a book of his called The News Inside. So anyway, a lot of years had passed, and I realized I have all these poems I've been writing for years. Maybe 90% of them I've never even typed up. They're still in my journals. I need to do something to kickstart myself to put a title on it to put a title on the poem. So I, I, I said, well, I'm going to start a Facebook group called Hard and Daily. It'll force me to type up my poem. I'll do it Monday through Friday. The weekends are, you know, for recuperation for my readers and for me. And um, I didn't realize I'd be going this far. Uh, I just thought I'd do it for that first year. And then the pandemic hit. And, you know, so it just seemed like I think there are about close to 270 people who are in this in this group. Um, you can't go looking for it because I have. I mean, somebody has to let me know they want to be in it, and I will put you in. But you can't find it on Facebook. But it just becomes a way for me to to follow through on. I mean, I've, I've always been good at 
following through on writing the new thing. Not so adept in recent years of typing it up, maybe sending it out. I mean, the, the book that just came out, um, Watermark, like I said, I, I finished that mostly in 2009. Um, I have seven books, which is so strange to think about, and almost nothing I've written since 2010 has ever appeared in a book. Um, I got like tw uh, 12 years of poems that I don't know what I'm going to do with. <laughs> Probably lost to time or something. But, um, but I, you know, y'all don't need me to tell you this, but I, writing is not always about publication, although I've been blessed in that area. But it's really just a way of, of being in the world, um, of cataloging the day and having a few thoughts that come to you and end up in some kind of shape on a page. And there's a, I mean, there's first of all a joy in that and just writing and putting something on a page. But it doesn't really have to be read by anybody to be useful, you know. Any other questions? No, no, it's it's it's, it's hardened daily. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just put up a poem that I write that morning, and or sometimes I'll go back and find, oh, this is a poem that's in my journal from eight years ago, this date, and I'll, if it's never been typed up, I'll put that in there. Um, it also kind of just lets people see the process because, um, I mean, I think people. I mean, maybe they're surprised sometimes. I don't know. But uh, maybe I'll say it this way. There's a particular poet that I really, really admire. I mean, there are lots of poets I really admire. Um, but I, I, this was one I introduced one year at the Southern Festival of Books. And I think this book is incredibly good. And um, I made some comment about a particular poem in that book that was, you know, my favorite. It had never been accepted by a literary journal. In fact, most of the poems in that book, which I think is a really, really incredibly fine collection of poems, most of those poems floated around for years. This is somebody that I might look at and go, oh yeah, he's successful. You know, like he's he's got it going on. No, he's, he's uh, getting rejected just like I am. And maybe the poems that I think of as the strongest ones never find an editor that uh, that likewise thinks this is incredible. So I wanted to kind of dispel a little of the mythologies that I think we all build up around the success or lack of success or whatever uh, when it comes to publishing. And so, hey, here's the poem I wrote. And, um, you know, maybe you may, you may or may not ever see it again in a book. And even if you see it again, it may not exactly resemble this shape or form. Um, I don't think most of us get really lucky with something straight out of the gate that is like flawless. <laughs> that doesn't seem to happen that often. And it's just kind of making myself vulnerable, I suppose, with whatever the whatever the daily poem is. So and sometimes I go back and look at them and you know, that's it's just a record of what I was doing and thinking about. Um it might not rise to the level of something that's worth being in a liter literary magazine or a book, but I think, as I said, I think it's still useful. Um, and then another thing, I, maybe I'll say this and, and hush, but um, when my second book came out in 2013, that was a, a kind of eye-opener for me in a way because I, I sometimes would get comments from people about poems in the book that, you know, if I've got 50 poems, I'm going to go do a reading. I, I kind of have the ones that I think are the ones I want to put forward, right? I mean, maybe I like all the poems, but these are the ones I think that will, you know, kind of really stand out. And I discovered um, every reader is different. 
And what matters to one reader doesn't matter to another one. Or what matters to the reader doesn't isn't one of the poems that really caught my attention. And that that was eye opening. I mean, it's probably obvious to anybody, but it's still it's like so I think I think you have to let matter what matters to the person to whom it matters. And there may be poems that I do in my hardened daily that never go anywhere, you know, in terms of like ending up in the Southern Review or whatever. But some of them really matter to maybe one one reader or five. And that's the poem, that one. And that's okay. So I'm just kind of making a space for that to to be the case. Anything else? Look at David over there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the bow. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, that's awesome. Um, we are blessed, Jeff. And it's a renowned local poet and a good teacher and where you know he inspires and actually the five line poems you should try I did one time we had a meeting at the coffee shop and um, right outside and um, we were talking about it and there was a mockingbird I always tell the story and it was like stretching really like relaxed and spring day I think Mm, after uh, hosting a place from the neighborhood. And uh, it was so, like, you had to write a poem, so I just did a five-line poem and gave it to him. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay, that's great. So, you know, it's kind of uh, good to try different menus and mm, different um, methods of writing. He's experimenting. So, you know, that's um, what comes to heart and mind. So uh, we are blessed to have so many uh, poets who inspire us. Um, and Bill Brown, uh, like he said, um, yeah, he couldn't be here today, but he sends his greetings to everyone. Um, so uh, Jeff, we have, um, Jeff had been here um, every time he's one of our um, unwavering supporters and had done workshops, uh, wonderful ones, and uh, we thank him for that. Um, um, and you all know him, but um, um, here's his bio. Um, Jeff Hardin is the author of six previous collections of poetry, and uh, the latest one is Watermark, just came out, so that makes it seven. Um, before that, uh, clearing space in the middle of being and no other kind of world and small revolutions. His work has been honored with the Nicholas Rorich Poet Prize, the Donald Justice Prize, and the X.J. Kennedy Prize. The chapbook, Generosity for a Later Generation, recently appeared. Uh, from Seven Kitchen Press. He's a professor of English at Columbia State Community College, where he has taught for almost three decades. And uh, his website, uh, com. Yeah, and my son was here. He was a student. He was taking English at Columbia, and he said, oh, I know Jeff Hardin. So he was here. Um, yeah. So thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm.